happiness is beautiful It's a kind of reality Happiness is the highest good Happiness is free So let's be so very happy Yeah, let's be so very happy Yeah, let's be so very happy Welcome to The Happiness Show. This is George Ortega, and I'm here to talk about happiness because happiness is, always has been, and always will be the point of it all. Tonight we're going to be talking about the third classic happiness increase experiment, and um, it was conducted by Michael Fordyce, and it was called A Program to Increase Happiness, Further Studies, and it appeared in the Journal of Counseling Psychology, 1983, Volume 30, Number 4. Now, after going through this experiment, I'm going to summarize the previous two classic happiness increase experiments and then draw some conclusions regarding the three. Okay, so these, these four new experiments were basically modified replications of studies one, two, and three that Dr. Fordyce conducted back in 1977. Okay, then the difference in these experiments were that um, they provided more stringent controls um, in, in order to prevent artifacts. In other words, the control groups were, were more stringently uh, con um, regulated. Um, they utilized a greater um, variety of, of criterion measures. Um, in other words, in this case, instead of just measuring for happiness, they also measured for other uh, emotional health um, aspects, um, measures, um, in other words, I, I, he was trying to find out whether by increasing happiness, one can also increase one's level of mental health. And then um, the third um, part of, of the, these studies that was new was that um, Dr. Fordyce wanted to find out if, um, if the results would be maintained over a much longer period of time. Okay, so... Um, so before we go into them, I just want to briefly recount the 14 fundamentals. And, and these are the fundamentals of happiness that the subjects were taught. Um, okay, they're worded a bit differently than Dr. Fordyce did in 1977, but um, basically they, uh, they are keep, keep busy and be more active, spend more time socializing, be productive at meaningful work, get better organized and plan things out, stop worrying, lower your expectations and aspirations, develop positive optimistic thinking, become present oriented, de develop an outgoing social personality, work on a healthy personality, be yourself, eliminate negative feelings and problems, close relationships are the number one source of happiness, and put happiness as your most important priority. Okay, so let's go through study number four. Um, in this study, the control group re received a part one of the training, and part one was reviewing the past literature on happiness, receiving lectures on the meaning and importance of happiness, and they were given just a brief overview of the 14 fundamentals, okay? Now the experimental group, in addition to that, also received detailed elaboration on each of the 14 fundamentals. And um, in addition to that, they received um, cognitive and behavioral techniques to help them achieve the 14 fundamentals. Okay, like for example, some, um, some examples of, of the techniques that they were given, like um, for the fundamental stop worrying, they were told to keep a daily record of their worries, to analyze the amount of time they spent worrying, to determine how many worries actually come true, and to use thought substitution techniques to avert uh, worrying. Okay, so um, the training lasted for about 11 weeks and um, 10 separate measures of happiness were used. Um, the results were that um, basically the more information the subjects were given, the greater um, their level of happiness increase. Okay, and the, the techniques and understanding the principles were considered the main factors um, attributed to this increase. And I just want to break down the, um, the results in terms of percentages. 6% um, of the subjects um, in the experimental group, of course, experienced extreme happiness increase. 
30% experienced much greater happiness, 39% um, improved somewhat in their happiness, 6% experienced slight increments, 17% uh, experienced no effect, and 2% actually had a decrease in, in their level of happiness. Um, sometimes what happens is people will become aware of their unhappiness through this and that, that will make them feel worse. But um, yeah, of the 19% that didn't really gain, um, a lot of them, about you know 17% or so, really were very happy to begin with. And it's been found that um, <coughs> when when one is very happy, it's much more difficult to become even happier. You know, at least through through these methods. Okay. Um, so now with study five, um, the control group was given the same introduction and detailed information. They were given de detailed information for the fundamentals, okay? And again, the experimental group was given uh, um, full instruction in all the fundamentals, and uh, measures of emotional health were again taken. And the four fundamentals that were also taught to the control group were uh, to spend more time socializing, be more active, be productive at meaningful work, and to get better organized. And they were given these basically because they were considered um, the easiest for them to follow. Okay, now, um, they, uh, after 10 weeks of instruction, um, the results were that um, there really wasn't much difference between um, the control group and the experimental group in this experiment. Um, they increased happiness, but, you know, there wasn't a difference between the two groups. Um, they did find ingre increases in mental health as a result of the training. So, so um, Dr. Fordyce's, um, you know, uh, his theory, his hypothesis that be uh, becoming happier will result in greater em emotional health w was, um, was verified by this. And um, again, the, the, the study was considered a bit too stringent because there wasn't such a difference between the control group and the experimental group. And I think the, the important consideration, though, here was that um, they found that the, the four fundamentals, those, just those four fundamentals of the 14, were actually very effective in increasing um, their level of happiness. Because apparently their, their, their level of happiness increased greatly without having to learn the other uh, 10. Okay, um, what I'm going to do now, um, before going through study six, I, I want to do a song. And um, this song is about, um, it's about pain and, and overcoming it in terms of evolution. And it's kind of like, it's couple of, kind of like a double entendre in a sense. It's like, it's serious in a way, but it's also kind of in a, in a humorous, um, it's, it's presented in a humorous way. So, okay, let's see how it goes.
really does not have to be such a silly thing. See, friends, those are hot and near. Our brains can make it crystal clear to me. Go do it, you did tremble. Then mommy came along and made the job feel so much fun. And also very pleasantly, that dreaded thing was done. Pain really does not have to be such a silly thing. See, when stoves are hot and they're near, our brains can make it crystal clear to me. Maybe you say this does not necessarily apply to our anatomy And you might think without pain there could be no pleasure And the only thing that I can say is only time will tell And if it turns out that my song is right that surely would be swell Pain really does not have to be such a silly thing to see when stoves are hot and hands are near. Our brains can make it crystal clear. The way we so very pleasantly. Okay, um, let's see. All right, so yeah, let's let's um, begin to explore um, study number six. Um, this one was interesting. This one um, was conducted with five groups. Okay, um, one group was given complete instruction in the 14 fundamentals and the various techniques by which to achieve them. Then groups two, three, and four were only given one third of the four, 14 fundamentals. Okay, and five was a control group, and uh, in, this, in this case, they were given no detailed information about happiness. You know, that was like in the experiments one, two, and three in 1977. Okay, and um, in this series of experiments, um, they, used, um, they used time testing. In other words, they tested them every two weeks to see um, how they progressed in their level of happiness increase. Okay, um, just want to go, um, group two, okay, um, the kinds of fundamentals that they were given related to life, lifestyle changes. Um, for example, one of them is like to keep busy and be more active, okay? And then they were, in addition to that, they were given the, the fundamental close relationships of the number one source of happiness, okay? And um, group three was given attitude and value related fundamentals. An example of that um, kind of fundamental is to lower one's aspirations, expectations. And, um, and again, they were also given the fundamental close relationships are the number one source for happiness. And um, group four was given personality-based fundamentals, like, for example, uh, be yourself. Okay. And what's interesting about this also was the way they chose which fundamentals to give them, which one-third of the 14, is they were pre-tested before these experiments began, and um, it was determined which of these um, kinds of fundamentals they um, scored lowest in, which, which of these um, their personalities were weakest in. Okay? So... Um, the results were, again, the, the control group, as expected, didn't uh, increase in their level of happiness. And um, what was interesting that was that all of the, each of the experimental groups, um, one, two, three, and four, had uniformly increasing levels of happiness. Okay, and they, they pretty much um, increased um, their, their happiness to the same extent also. Um, the life, lifestyles group experienced the greatest gain, but it really wasn't much different than, than the other groups. And again, you know, th those who received the full 14 fundamentals really increased their level of happiness. Um, no, they did no better than, than the other um, groups that only received one-third, which, which is very, very interesting. Uh, it seems that, um, 
you know, one of the findings in happiness literature is that um, we can become happier in so many different kinds of ways, in, in exercise, in personality changes, in goals, in comparisons, you know, through so many different kinds of methods. And I think this, this experiment um, pretty much reflected that. Okay. Um, now, let, let's go on to study number seven, the last study in, in this series. And basically, he wanted to find out if these um, results were, were long-lasting, if, if after um, a certain amount of time, you know, the happiness increases were, would, would still be felt by, the, by these um, subjects. Okay, so the subjects in this experiment were questioned from between nine and 18 months after the training ended. And here are the results. Um, about 29% of the subjects found the information after 9 to 18 months made them somewhat happier. About 25% um, said that as a result of the training, they were a good deal happier. And about 24% said the training um, made them, um, helped them extremely in their happiness. And again, this is after nine to 18 months. So, it, you know, these experiments pretty much demonstrated that, that in fact, these, these subjects had integrated learning into their personalities. Uh, much of the learning had probably become habit so that, um, so that these increases really were, um, were, f were felt over a long um, period of time. Now, on average, after these uh, nine to 18 months, the, the estimated um, the increase of happiness was about 12 percent, okay? Um, so the, the, the subjects said that they were about 12 percent happier than they felt they would have been without the training. And uh, what's interesting about this is that, um, again, when we're very happy, it's much more difficult to become happier. So you probably had, uh, within this group, many people who weren't perhaps so very happy, because you have to remember our, our average level of happiness here in the United States is 69%, which isn't all that happy. I think a lot of people became much happier than this 12%. Um, Okay, um, what I'd like to do now is, is basically summarize the, the, um, the three different happiness increase techniques that were used in, in the classic experiments. Um, the, f the first one involved um, instruction in fundamentals, and, and that, was like, that was used in 1977 and again in 1983, as, as explained in this show. Um, then the second strategy they used for increasing the level of happiness, that was done by um, the New Zealand team in 1980, and that, that involved just simply discussing issues that are related to, to happiness. And, um, you know, they, they succeeded in, in uh, raising their subject's level of happiness by about 25%, um, I think at about four weeks in that way. And then the third method that was used, it was again by the New Zealand team, um, uh, they, they used affirmations. Um, basically, the subjects recited um, positive affirmations for about 10 minutes each morning, and they, they were able, I think, to increase their level of happiness by about 25% in that way after two weeks. Okay, um, now again, the, so for, for all of these experiments, the initial um, increase in level of happiness was about 25%, okay? and um, so, yeah, and again, long term it was 12%, but initially it was 25 And, you know, if, if you apply that 25% to our 69% level of happiness, uh, uh, which we have average as a nation, that would raise our level of happiness to 86%. Okay? And um, if you take the long range, long term uh, increase in happiness of 12% and apply it to that 69%, then. Um, the increase would amount to 77, um, would, would take that, the average level to 77 percent. So, um, and again, these, these tests, you know, this training went on for at most two and a half months. So one might speculate that if the training went on for six months or a year, um, the 25 percent or more increase in happiness could actually um, be very possible. And another consideration is that uh, a lot of times they found that um, at the cutoff of the um, experiments, you know, 
uh, the subjects were actually increasing their level of happiness. So again, if they could, if they would have gone for four or five months, um, they conceivably would have experienced um, greater gains. Okay. Um, now I want to go over like the state of happiness increase research since 1983, which was the period of these, the last of these three happiness increase experiments. Because uh, this, this is very important, actually. Um, basically, there were no replications made of these experiments immediately after results, which is, which is kind, of, um, kind of baffling. I'll, I'll go into perhaps some explanation for this um, a bit later. But um, then what happened was in 1992, um, Bruce Heady and Alex Waring wrote a book called Understanding Subjective Well-Being. Uh, subjective well-being is really the scientific term for happiness. And in it, they, they proposed a theory that, that, um, that long-term happiness increase was really not possible. You know, and again, this, this was a theory. It was never tested out. But, um, but you know, one could, um, one could speculate that, that perhaps people believed in that theory. So for, for an additional six years, from 1992 to 1998 or so, um, no additional happiness increase experiments were, um, were conducted. Okay, um, over the last weeks, um, last couple of weeks in preparation for the show, I consulted with some of the leading authorities on happiness um, to, to really try to understand the state of, of happiness increase experiments and why they are not conducted perhaps as much as they could be. And one of the people I con uh, consulted with was Dr. Ruth Veenhoven of the Netherlands, and he's basically the leading expert on international happiness. Okay, um, so one of the things that he, he, he um, cited, one of the reasons was that actually there's just too little mo money um, available for this kind of research. And the reason for this is like, for example, with a pharmaceutical, um, for let's say on research on depression, you have a lot of money going into that kind of research be because the pharmaceutical companies need that kind of research to demonstrate that their um, antidepressants work. So there, there's a great vested interest in, in conducting that research. Um, Dr. Wienhoven also said that, that science in general, and he, um, he particularly noted clinical psychologists don't tend to value happiness much. Um, you know, it, it's, very, it's very ironic because really the, the, the goal of, of clinical psychologists is to help individuals become happier, but, but they don't seem to val value it. And, um, one of the things he also pointed out was that happiness isn't very often used as an outcome variable in their, um, in their um, studies to see how effective psychotherapy is. In other words, there, there are many kinds of psychotherapy, and generally you want to see how effective they are, so you, you create studies, and then you create conditions that these studies would have to meet in order to see the, the effectiveness. But apparently, you know, happiness doesn't um, generally um, apply. It's not factored in. And um, then, um, then his last his last comment was that um, this the training uh, Dr. Fordyce's and perhaps the the New Zealand team's um, training just may not apply to everyone. And again, you know, too little uh, research has been done to demonstrate whether it it would or not. But you know, based actually on Dr. Fordyce's and, and the New Zealand team's research, um, it seemed that. Um, it did apply to a, to a great uh, portion of, of that um, of, of the subjects that um, they were ex experimentally um, trained in that way. And um, the second person that I consulted with um, was Dr. Ed Diener of the University of Illinois, and he's actually the top um, researcher, uh, happiness researcher, researcher in the world. Um, he he thought that perhaps um, Dr. Fordyce included too many components in his experiments. In other, in other words, those 14 fundamentals included many, many factors that, that would probably be difficult to replicate. Um, so that, that was his um, suggestion as to perhaps why um, more studies haven't been done on this. Okay, the good news, though, is that um, in 1998, uh, Martin Seligman um, created what's known as the positive psychology movement. And the idea was that um, for years, psychologists have been studying negative emotions. Like for every 100 studies on sadness, there's one study on happiness. So he's trying to like equalize this imbalance. 
and, and coinciding with the positive psychology movement, um, various researchers again began to take up the, uh, the topic of happiness increase. And um, the most significant of these researchers are Sonja Lubimirsky and Ken Sheldon. Okay, they've been, um, they, um, they actually, I, I've been communicating with them recently. They sent me um, a couple of manuscripts that they have. One of them's in press and one of them's being reviewed by a, a major professional journal. And they're, they've really taken up the cause of happiness increase. They're, they're presenting um, a lot of evidence that long-term happiness increase is, is very possible. And um, they really are the leaders in the field. So it'll be exciting to see over the next few years what kind of um, results their, their experiments will have. Um, there are other researchers, like a Dr. Emmons, who, who sent me his paper recently on, um, on how he was using gratitude as a, as a means of, of increasing happiness. In other words, he taught his subjects to be more grateful for what we have in life, our blessings. And in that way, he demonstrated that, um, that people, you know, can become much happier. So, you know, really, um, Again, um, there are many, many different ways to become happier, and these, these um, researchers are really beginning to explore um, in great detail what it, it takes. So, um, so now, I guess the next step really is to, to determine how best to, um, to institute policy changes and, and um, strategies to, um, to conduct more of these happiness increase studies because they've been incredibly successful in the past and I have a feeling that uh, the ones that are being conducted now will be equally as successful and and really as they refine their techniques as they begin to understand happiness increase more I suspect that uh, the levels of increase that uh, we've seen will even, will even, even um, ra rise beyond uh, what we've seen. Okay, well that's all we have time for tonight. Thanks for watching. In the future we'll explore other to topics designed to help us better enjoy life. This is George Ortega saying, be good, think well, feel very happy, and I hope you join me again next week here on The Happiness Show. Happiness is powerful. It's our underlying need. Happiness is why we live each day. Happiness is destiny. So let's be so very happy. Yeah, let's be so very happy Yeah, let's be so very happy